All right, hey everybody, this is James Lindsay. You are listening to the New Discourses podcast. We are still ripping our way through Paulo Freire's critical education theory. In particular, we're in the middle of a series inside of a series. I don't know, maybe it's a series inside of a series inside of a series. I don't know. Uh, Engaging his book, The Politics of Education from 1985. We're doing a very deep dive through this book. As a matter of fact, we are crawling through this book. I did two podcasts in the broader critical education theory series about the introduction to this book. Took a diversion into the religion of Marxism, which is very important to understand. Marxism is a theology. Communism is the religion. And to understand it as such is kind of required to understand Freire. So we took a diversion into the theology of Marxism. Now we've pulled back. I did a episode in this series that dealt with chapters... Um, one and two, uh, then another, there's three and four, and then another, that was chapter five, and then we're going to go into chapter six now, and I think I'm going to break, even though it's not particularly long, I think I'm going to break chapter six into two podcasts, and we'll see how we do when we get to seven, eight, and nine, which are also very important chapters to understanding what's going on with Freire. Then, this is why I said series within a series within a series, we'll turn back a step to look at Paulo Freire's book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is kind of his key book and the kind of key book behind all of education. The idea, one of the ideas I want you to take home from these Freire podcasts is unless your child is in a very fortunate situation, your child goes to Paulo Freire's schools. In the same way that we all live in Herbert Marcuse's world, which is repressive tolerance and a new sensibility and intersectionality and sustainability and all of this nonsense. In the same way that we live in, in, in Herbert Marcuse's world, we also have children who all go to Paulo Freire's schools. Paulo Freire has been adopted virtually uh, universally in colleges of education and has made, been made central to them. So it's very important that we understand In fact, I go so far as to say all of these things that we hear about now, like culturally responsive education, culturally relevant education or teaching, which is the same thing, really, culturally sustaining education, which is like putting it on steroids, those are just a repackaging of Freire. Social emotional learning actually has deep roots that tie to Freire, as you will hear if you listen to the episode of this series dealing with chapter five of this book, where Freire points out that the distance between social worker and educator is not that far, because both should be awakening a socio-political consciousness, in other words, a Marxist consciousness, in place of literacy, uh, or as, as Freire understands literacy. And so in this leg of this sprawling series as we unpack lots of Freire to understand what's going on at the heart of our schools, why our children can't read, something like a third or fewer of children in most districts are at grade level in reading and math and history and science. And the reason we're going to find out is that they are Freire in schools now. Your kids go to Paulo Freire schools. And the reason that that means they can't read is because Freire is throughout this book. If you listen to this entire series, you will you will hear unambiguously, or if you don't want to listen to me, get the book, read it. He's on a relentless attack against skills-based learning. Basic literacy and functional literacy, as we've talked about repeatedly in the series, are out. Political literacy is in. Literacy means actually being literate either in a Marxist sociopolitical sense for Freire, which is what he wants to do, make education about consciousness or about becoming formally educated in the existing system, and which, of course, he says maintains or reproduces oppression. And so what we're going to find out what we're, as we go through chapter six, and what I'm going to focus on in chapter six as we unpack it, is the reinvention, Freire's reinvention of education, education itself as a Marxist theory. So this isn't putting Marxism into education theory. This is making education theory Marxist. It's actually far more profound and insidious, far more radical, as in going to the root. And this is probably why Freire is such a big deal. So the title of chapter six in this uh, book, The Politics of Education by Paulo Freire, 
And this is a workhorse chapter. I'm going to go over the whole structure of the, the whole chapter and kind of outline what it's doing. And then we're going to, uh, break into, um, break it into two pieces and kind of go through bit by bit. But the title of the, the chapter is the adult literary, l- sorry, the adult literacy process as cultural action for freedom. So adult literacy is going to be framed as a process. Literacy is a process. And so the adult literary literacy process is going to be taken as cultural action for freedom. And so what he's going to do is he's going to compare and contrast two approaches to adult literacy. And he's going to basically create the Marxist theory of education that I said. He's going to reproduce Marxism as pedagogy. And it's, you'll understand by the end of the podcast. So this episode, we're going to go through kind of his framing. And then in the next episode, we're going to go through what he does with it here in just chapter six, two episodes. So bear with me. Just wait till we get to the pedagogy of the oppressed. It's going to be thrilling how we're going to drag that out. But you have to understand. Okay, so this chapter is going to open up with a reiteration of the Marxist theory of man, as expressed by Paulo Freire, a uh, prophet of the Marxist theology. This then going to go in, and we're going to hear that just in a minute. And then it's going to go into two conceptions of the illiterate that he says are kind of given and that we have to use to interpret what education really is, what education really represents. And that's what we're going to focus on today is these two cons- the opening, the theory of man that he gives. It's just a repackaging of Marx's ontology of man. And then the illiterate. Uh, having these two different conceptions so that he can shift it away from his caricature of education, just like Marx had a caricature of a free market called capitalism. Freire is going to have a caricature of education and literacy, and he's going to move it away from the caricature he associates with the existing society into the so-called liberation approach. And so the first of those two sections is the illiterate as empty, which he says is basically the bad theory of man uh, as it pertains to a Marxist education program. And then the illiterate is marginal, which is going to then clarify, although it's not, it, that can be done right and wrong. But we're going to look at, so what Ferrari's general argument is, is that there are kind of two ways to look at people who are illiterate. One is that they are empty and need to be filled in. And that's going to be filled in with the existing society, and that's bad. One is that they are marginal and that's excluded from participation in society, and of course that's bad. But then when you see the illiterate as a marginal figure, then the Marxist theory of education comes into into being. And so this is a clarifying theory of man and the relationship to education and literacy that will go along to structure central uh, structural marginalization and thus give bloom to a Marxist theory of education. So then he goes on in the next section is a, the adult literacy process or, uh, uh, as an act of knowing. And so then we're going to talk about, and this will be the next episode of the podcast, but this is the next section in the chapter. Um, he's going to go into, actually, I don't know, maybe I'm talking about this one in this I've gone through this whole book and so made lots and lots of notes. Okay, no. So we're, we're, we're going to do this and then that's where we're going to start off in the next, pro- next episode of the podcast. The adult literacy process is an act of knowing, going into kind of one of Freire's big, allegedly big contributions, which is dialogue is methodology. The goal there is actually going to be to erase the distinction between teacher and student and to shift into an educator and learner's frame, which sounds different, but it or sounds the same, but it's not. The synonyms are politically actionable. Every woke word contains or conceals an agenda. And then this chapter actually, and this is one of the reasons that I wanted to focus so much on this book, ends in a profoundly religious um, section called Sowers of the Word which you can already hear, that just sounds like some gospel stuff, right? Sowers of the word. Um, It sounds like some evangelistic thing. We're going to go sow the word of the Lord throughout the world. We're going to plant the word of the Lord and be evangelists, sowers of the word. And so we're going to recall from the previous chapters in this section or the series that, and in this book, that Freire says that you have to learn to read, meaning become politically literate, which means become Marxist consciousness. You have to learn to read so that you can speak the word, meaning that you're going to speak the word as a political entity, 
uh, so that you can proclaim the world. So speak the word to proclaim the world is the Freirian concept. And in later chapters, he talks about how this is a process of denouncing the existing world and announcing the new world in a kind of continuous revolutionary process. This book is, in fact, where Freire's famous remark that for the revolution to be authentic, it must be perpetual comes from. And so that's the structure of this chapter. So we have this idea that we're going to frame out a theory of man, a whole ontology of what man is, what human beings, what it means to be human. And then we're going to see, we're going to shift that into the context of the illiterate, who's going to be seen as either empty to be filled in by the existing society, thus reproducing it, or marginal, thus needing to be centered. And that's the Marxist theory and a blossoming of the Marxist program within the context of education occurs. Uh, an education, a neo-Marxist education program. And then, like I said, we're going to go into what he sees as what you do with that, which is the adult literacy process as an act of knowing. And we're going to see that what Freire is actually doing is redefining what it means to be educated, to be a Marxist, to redefine what knowledge is as Marxism or consciousness, and then to use this dialogical method, which is an entire chapter. There are only four chapters in the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and his dialogical method is one of the four chapters, uh, actually kind of two of the four chapters, the third and fourth chapters, if I recall correctly. And then the sowers of the world, of the word to create the world. And so this is the Marxist creation view that man is creator of society, thus man. And so this is what we're going to actually see throughout this entire chapter. So we're reading chapter six, the, the first half of chapter six, the adult literacy process is a cultural action for freedom. Freedom means freedom from any constraints on your subjectivity, because again, the Marxist theology is very simple. You're, you are a subject, you are a person with a subjective consciousness and a, a subjective experience of the world. And you are a subject in that regard. Not, and so what you end up having the capacity to do is to imagine the world as you wish it was, or imagine something you want to bring into the world. Then you create that objectively out in the world by your labor, which is different from the labor of animals, which has no imagination connected to it. So you create your vision in the world that puts you in a in a dialectical relationship between your imagination and yourself, who you see yourself to be included, and the object you created. So you see yourself as a creator and having created the thing in the world. Plus, you got to see the thing in your head become manifest in the world. And so what you're trying to do is free yourself you're trying to free yourself from anything that might possibly constrain the limits of your subjectivity. In other words, your imagination. And so if that's reality, it's reality. You have to free yourself from anything that might constrain the limits of your subjectivity. And so that's the Marxist program. And if we could completely liberate ourselves or become free, then we create a free world where people are no longer oppressed. That's literally the whole thing. Okay. And so to frame out before we dive into this chapter, I know I've already gone on a while, um, but to frame this out, I actually want to tell you this is relevant. This is your kids go probably, very probably go to Freyarian schools. And this is just a f uncomfortable and ugly fact. And so I have this Twitter thread that I did the other day, uh, kind of coincidentally, right after I read this chapter and made notes on it, I read this chapter like three or four times and as I was making notes on it, because I really wanted to make sure I got it. And so what this was is somebody had sent me an image from a Pennsylvania high school. I think he said it was 11th grade and a, st a statistics lesson. And uh, so I said, this is how critical race theory actually gets into the schools. And in case, this case, it's a high school in Pennsylvania. A mathematics or statistics here lesson was retooled through social theory examples. And that serves as a basis for a theory-based discussion that will follow. The Soviets did it this way too, and then I said this is Freyerian. So what you have on this little document, this image, says the table summarizes data from the U.S. Census about children in the United States and millions who are living in poverty in 2008, and the, it says it's a simple chart, white, non-white, total on the, the one side, and then 
in poverty, not in poverty, total on the other. And the questions are describe in full context the meaning of the number 26 in this table, which appears as non-white, not in poverty. Next question. What is the probability that a child selected at random in 2008 would be in poverty? What is the probability that a randomly selected child is white and in poverty? What is the probability that a randomly selected child is non-white and in poverty? What is the probability that a randomly selected child is in poverty given he or she is white? And so on. Okay? And so at the very last question, after all these probability questions, is poverty independent of race? The person, the student has written in no. Use probabilities to explain. Someone who is non-white is more likely to be in poverty is the answer with a calculation uh, showing this. And I said that this is Freyerian, and this is what we've been talking about throughout this entire book, that what this actually is, is the use of generative concepts being foisted into another lesson. And a lot of people reacted very angrily when I put this on Twitter, and they said, this is just census data, blah, 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 this isn't politics. But we all know very clearly that had we had other um, data that showed, for example, that statistically speaking, young black men c cause far more of the violent crime in the country than are responsible for far more, of, I should say, of the violent crime in the country than any other demographic, then they would have went ballistic. They would have been able to see the political agenda that might or might not have even been there, probably would have been there, they would have been able to see it very clearly then. And so using neutral examples like, you know, about bananas or something or about diseases or about something very simple takes the politics out of it and teaches the lesson. But there's a deliberate choice to pick something that has to do with race and poverty because it's going to engender A, thinking about race and poverty and B, open up the door to hijacking your statistics or math class to talk about this. It was a generative concept along with the so-called uh, world that they, or word or whatever that they expect, right? So you you're, that, that they experience, I should say, because lived experience, the pathos, uh, lived experience is the center of the Marxist religion as a lived experience of oppression in particular, of suffering or a feeling like the world isn't ordered for you and how miserable that is. And so you can see the politics behind the lesson. And I said, this is how you get CRT in the school. So you bring this up. This looks like a neutral lesson or whatever, and people will argue about it. And then the classroom discussion is going to be guided and informed by critical race theory on, well, why is this the case? And in fact, the last question is poverty independent of race. Um, and so you can see how this goes. And what I explained on Twitter, I said, Paulo Freire, and this is in fact the chapter that I took screenshots of and showed to make my point. It's Apollo Freire, a Marxist educator and religious figure from Brazil, has had more influence on North American education than anyone since John Dewey, who in his own right modeled American ed on the model he observed in the USSR in the 1920s. So understanding Freire is crucial. And I said, I'm doing podcasts on this now. In fact, I was about to sit down and have just got distracted at being about a week ago to do this exact episode at the time. Freire, I said, claimed to be teaching adult literacy to peasants in impoverished Brazil, Chile, and Argentina, but he was really retooling literacy to mean Marxist political literacy, that is, critical consciousness. He hijacked adult literacy programs to turn them into Marxism, and he did so explicitly. And then this is the screenshots of this chapter of the book. In fact, what we're about to read from it. I said he reframed literacy education away from phonics into a frame of generative words. Rather than teaching what he calls nonsensical syllables, literacy would involve, so in, that, that makes sense by the way in Portuguese or in Spanish it would as well, where you practice various syllables and learn to recognize and identify with the sounds because it's a com almost completely phonetic language. Um, whereas in English, it doesn't quite work that way, but what you, you don't learn to identify syllables and the sounds associated with them. You learn to sound out words through letters. We call that phonics, and it's phonics in both cases, really, and he's against that. And so he says, rather than teaching nonsensical syllables, literacy would involve learning words that raise consciousness. And he gives, in fact, in this chapter, the example of the word struggle. And then literacy gets redefined as Marxists will do, to mean political literacy. And that can either be in the existing system or it can be Marxist. And obviously one of those is good and one of those is bad. One of those, in fact, 
is bourgeois and one of those is uh, revolutionary or proletarian. And so in that sense, he's creating the so-called working class intellectuals that Antonio Gramsci was calling for, you know, some, I guess this would have been 60 years earlier, where he said that there needed to be a rising up of the working class intellectuals who are going to be educated from within the system and about their struggle and their oppression that were going to lead the workers' revolution. And so then we return to this Pennsylvanian math lesson and we see there's math here, there's statistics here, and the questions are legitimately statistical and they're using real tabular data, etc. But it's done in the context of using generative concepts of race, race and poverty and their correlation with one another. It could have been any other thing. There are a million, there, there's an infinite number actually of possible data sets anybody could choose from. But with Freire, phonics is out and political discussion around generative words is, it, is in. And I say same here. The point isn't about the mathematics or the statistics. The point is about creating so-called political literacy of oppression Marxist education then to raise Marxist political literacy. And I said, this is in, in fact, this is just a codification or sorry, the codification of the, this approach appeared in a Seattle mathematics education policy document from 2019. And this got a lot of rounds like three years ago and people I kind of guess have kind of forgotten about it. Actually, my first public talk for new discourses, which I gave in London, where I have the Harry Potter tie on, and people like to make fun of that, where I manspread in my <laughs> the same conference where I manspread in my profile image on Twitter. Um, I talked about this document there. I mentioned this. And so King County and Seattle and maybe Washington more broadly's math education adopted a framework by law. And it's been copied all down the West Coast. It's in Oregon. It's in California now, too. It's being clearly it's being implemented in Pennsylvania, and it's probably being implemented other places. And it has lots of very it has this document, very curious thoughts about how we should think about mathematics. Like we should be asking questions in mathematics education, like who holds power in a mathematical classroom? There's Freire's dialogical model, by the way. Is there a place for power and authority in the math classroom? We're getting back to the dialogical model. Who gets to say if an answer is right? What is the process for verifying the truth? Who is smart and who is not smart? These are the kinds of things that are on it. Can you recognize and name oppressive mathematical practices in your experience? Why and how does data-driven processes prevent liberation? It really does have that grammatical error in there. And so these are the kinds of things. How is math manipulated to allow inequality and oppression to persist? Who's doing the oppressing? Who does the oppression protect? Who does this oppression harm? Remember, this is in actual .gov, education.ed.gov document for the Seattle area. Uh, and again, I could pull up, if I could find it quickly again, the Oregon document that reproduces this stuff virtually exactly for their mathematics education, which California subsequently copied. So this is happening at least in those three states by law. Their Department of Education is putting this in. Uh, and again, this is in Pennsylvania, the example we're talking about. So it's spread from there. It's not just some weird Seattle thing. Um, it's about how is mathematics... Uh, manipulated to allow inequality and oppression to persist, to allow it to persist. Who's doing the oppressing? Who does the oppression protect? Who does the oppression harm? Where is there an opportunity to examine, uh, to examine systemic oppression? How can math help us understand the impact of economic conditions and systems that contribute to poverty and slave labor? This is exactly what's happening. How does math contribute to how we value natural resources? Uh, what is legitimate as math? Where are math skills considered real math? Um, how do communities of color, uh, are, are they affected by mathematics? When has math been used historically to resist and liberate? How can we use data to resist and liberate? How can we use math to measure the impact of activism? How can we change from mathematics? Sorry, how can we change mathematics from individualist to collectivist thinking? Right? How can we reframe our views of people and communities of color in mathematics? These are the kinds of things all over this document. Okay, These are the kinds of things all over this document. This is Freirean math education, and it's shifting. If we're going to do math and we have to do math in school, let's make it all about generative concepts and a dialogical model. It's just a reproduction of what we see in this chapter uh, vomited out into the mathematics program of Washington. And so I said Marxists have been implementing the Freirean model for decades, actually since this book in 1985. 
which was Freire's breakout moment into the U.S. education scene, at which point Pedagogy of the Oppressed became the key text, which is, by, by the way, again, the third most cited document in all of the humanities and social sciences. The culturally relevant teaching program that I talk about, there's a podcast on that, you can go listen to it, is just the identity Marxist repackaging of this Freirean BS. Then this is why your kids can't read, but they know how to be activists, because they are using the literacy lesson if we want to follow Freire exactly, the reading lesson, and they are kicking out actual techniques to learn how to read, and they're replacing them with politics discussions. They're using politically generative examples of words like struggle for Freire or mathematics examples like this, and then lots of the conversation in the classroom gets hijacked to talking about the social politics issue, and then Marxism is the frame through which it has to be understood. And then remember, in the previous episode of this podcast where we went through chapter 5, what we heard very explicitly, very clearly, unambiguously, was the blending of social work and education. It was a Freirean project as well. So the social-emotional learning that's being implemented in literally every subject on purpose is designed specifically to bring social work and education into the same space. In other words, to make your educational program not about educating at all, but about intervening with a Marxist to take Marx, Marxist take on political literacy to reframe all of education about that. And this is why your kids can't read because they're not being taught to read. They're taught, being taught to be political uh, activists in a Marxist sense, using literacy or reading lessons, writing lessons, um, math lessons, science lessons, etc., as proxies to introduce the political points. And this is not wholesale all that's happening, but it's rapidly increasing. And I say this again, framing out that the data are clear about one third of American students in these schools, which have been this way now for a while, can read at grade level, can participate in mathematics at grade level, etc. And then this goes deeper though. So they go to Freirean schools, but they also use Freirean books. Educational materials companies, I point, point, I point out, like Pearson, the world's largest, are participating this full, in this full blast and enthusiastically because it raises their ESG scores. In other words, it makes them shiny in the new world order that's trying to come along. ESG is the scam that's pulling us into this tyranny. It's the scam that makes it so all the money circulates around doing this instead of listening to parents or doing anything responsible or sensible. So they're ruining, companies like Pearson are ruining education and your kids with Marxism because it wins them prizes and points in this new evil system. And I gave some documentation of how into this uh, Pearson is in a recently released uh, policy document that they just put out. World Economic Forum, I say to finish out the thread, supports and pushes this nonsense as well with a video evidence. It's clearly part of the Great Reset Agenda that sets the stage for companies like Pearson plus school districts and whoever manage. who do you think manages their pension funds to play ball? But what they're playing ball with is your children and the way they're playing ball is by forcing them through a worthless Marxist education um, based off of Paulo Freire. So your kids go to Paulo Freire's schools. We live in Herbert Marcuse's world and our children go to Paulo Freire's schools. And that's the greatest summary of how neo-Marxism has been able to take over so much from the ground up. Meanwhile, that is all enforced from the top down by this ESG scam that's tied up in the World Economic Forum and BlackRock and these huge, huge companies, but more importantly, we just hear about Disney all over the place. More importantly than the companies, though, are the um, massive asset managers, the finance industry pulling them around. And then it's enforced heavily through the tech sector, which enables both financial manipulations like we saw with the Canadian truckers to make sure people play along, but also censorship and purges just in line with repressive tolerance from Marcuse. So what's this chapter about? Without diving straight in, um, Actually, my notes say, read the whole opening section, because it's actually that bad, uh, as it turns out. So um, let me figure out where I have that window, because I got too excited here. Um, what we're going to see is straight up uh, the um, tool. That if you go and read Nicholas Shackles, and I've talked about this a little bit in the past, uh, 
if you if you go read Nicholas Shackles, The Vacuity of Postmodern Methodology, which is a great little paper, he defines this concept called a troll's truism. And we're actually going to start off with a troll's truism. Marx, he says that it's the postmodernists, but in fact, it is the uh, Marxists in general use troll's truisms basically as their primary method. So what is a troll's truism? I mean, so we know what a troll is, sort of, but it you know, something disingenuous. A troll's truism is when somebody says something that's kind of blatantly true if you misunderstand the real point, but if you dig into the real point, it's blatantly false. Um, the philosopher Dan Dennett stole this and called them deepities after a uh, what a child said. And so the example Dennett gives is love is just a word. Um, yeah, it is, but you've missed the point, right? And so it's blatantly a truism or it's true if you miss the point of what's being communicated on purpose. And, you know, Helen has that stellar line in Cynical Theory she included that says that so much of this stuff looks like, you know, deliberately missing the point. You know, reading a text to deliberately miss the point so that you can make a political point is really what's going on. And so it starts off with a big troll's truism, uh, is what I point out. And I say, in fact, they're self-serving. The reason they play this little linguistic game is because it, it, it creates an advantage for them. And it said, it's, it's, you know, it, this is a typical troll's truism as we're going to hear in a second. And the self-serving Marxist assumption straight from the starting point. And that is, this will frame out what we're about to read, is that all educational practice comes from something that could be called an educational theory. So such a thing is always present. So better to use a conscious one than an unconscious one. So what Freire is going to do is say, there's always a theory of mankind behind education. There's always a theory of education, a pedagogy involved in educating. There's always one there. So we better pick the right one. You can't get away from one. People like to pretend there's a neutral position, but there's no such thing. There's always one, even if it's just as a matter of fact. Uh, there's always a theory, even if it's happenstance. So better to choose a conscious one than an unconscious one. So a deliberate one, and I should say, instead of a non-deliberate one. Um, maybe that far is true, but then there's the word conscious. And then that for him means Marxist because the Marxist truism in general is do it the Marxist way because everything else is unconscious at best and ideological at worst. And the theory and praxis that can transform the world by knowing it with a G like Gnostics would be the only legitimate one. This, by the way, is in general all of Marxism, every time, all the time. Such and such thing is already happening in the existing system. It's not happening correctly because we can point out problematics. We have special knowledge that tells you what's wrong and we know what the end goal should be. So we should seize the means of production of whatever the thing to guide it along our conscious path. And so the truism is there's always, in this case, as there's always an educational theory and always a theory of man behind it, there's always a theory present, regardless of if you know it or not. So we should pick one that that is deliberate, but in fact, that the only legitimate deliberate one is one that's conscious. And that's the self-serving thing with all of Marxism, everywhere you go. So this is why in critical race theory, they'll say this the school or whatever is already racialized. So when we bring up race, we're not racializing it, we're deracializing it. This is why Kendi says the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only re remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination because he's saying that the system itself is the thing discriminating. So you have to introduce discrimination in the opposite direction to, and this is the phrase, isn't it? Level the playing field. And if you read the educational documents through kind of the papers of critical race and education and so on that we talk about, say, in cynical theories, you'll see again and again, in fact, titles of papers are things like the unlevel knowing field. And so they have to level the knowing field. And that's for in education, leveling the knowing field. And so they talk about things like ec epistemic violence and epistemic oppression and epistemic exclusion, uh, epistemic injustice, and all of these complicated ideas, hermeneutic injustice, testimonial injustice, blah, blah, blah. And so you have all these complicated ideas. But the point is that they're going to say, oh, no, politics are always happening. Therefore, Conscious politics need to be happening. Theory and praxis that can transform the world is the only legitimate approach. And so we're going to see that trolls tru truism straight 
out of the way. And so um, what Freire actually says here is experience teaches us not to assume that the obvious is clearly understood. So it is with the truism with which we'll begin. All educational practice implies a theoretical stance on the educator's part. This stance in turns implies, sometimes more and sometimes less explicitly, an interpretation of man in the world. It could not be otherwise. So now we have this. There's always a theory. There's always, the, in fact, underlying philosophical set of assumptions under it. It could not be otherwise. And that's a truism, but it's a troll's truism. You're missing the, he's missing the point on purpose so that he can say what else he's going to say, which he goes on to say, the process of man's orientation in the world involves not just the association of sense images as for animals. It involves all else, thought language. That is the possibility of the act of knowing through his praxis by which man transforms reality. So it's like I just told you, there's always a theory, but it's not just this kind of thing like animals do. It's not just this association of sense images and reactions and so on. In fact, it involves a thought language, a dialectical combination of thought and language. And so language, or sorry, ideas framed out by, by language itself and the way that we think about things. And so we thus have the ability to know. That's how we actually have the ability to know is through thought language, which and he says the whole point of that is by which man transforms his reality. So Marxism, as I've said in other podcasts recently, in a nutshell is that the process of transforming reality is unconscious like natural selection up until the point of Marxism, at which point conscious awareness of the telos, the point, the purpose of history to get to communism as a teleology becomes in, uh, comes into the picture. And the people who are aware of this become the ones who can guide history correctly, whereas everybody else will be on the wrong side of history. Only they are on the right side of history because we're transforming reality anyway. And so the people who are consciously transforming it in the direction that they know is the greater good have all of the moral, intellectual, et cetera, standing. And everybody else is an idiot, is blind, has false consciousness, is uh, morally depraved, is selfish, et cetera. And the entire the entire um, repressive tolerance universe falls out of this assumption as well. The entire Marxist theology kind of falls out of this assumption. And so he says here, for man, this process of orientation in the world, I'm oh, sorry, let me go back before I say that, because he said, remember, this stance in turn implies sometimes more and sometimes less explicitly. That's what I'm saying. Some people, their thing is, well, most of you aren't really conscious of the fact that we're constantly transforming reality, but some of us are, so give us all the power. And he says, for man, this process of orientation in the world can be understood neither as a purely subjective event nor as an objective or mechanistic one, but only as an event in which subjectivity and objectivity are united. That's the dialectic of Marx. That's literally Marx's whole freaking ontology, is that for man, man is the, the unique thing in which subject and object can be dialectically synthesized, that they're united. That which you envision is that which you create into the world that which is in your subjective consciousness appears objectively in the world and thus reflectively informs how you understand the world and yourself within it. Thus, if somebody's engaging in a um, process of, say, having you work for their subjective vision of the world by being your boss and owning the capital and giving you directions, and then they just pay you, they alienate you from your productive creative process, your ability to know yourself through your work, your ability to see yourself as a creator, because you're creating for them. They can see themselves as creator, and they're putting you to work as a slave to create their creation while stealing your what makes you essentially human from you, alienating you uh, and estranging you from what makes you human at a fundamental level. And that is, that's, that's the view of Marxist Marxism and, and at a kind of a fundamental theological level. And so this is what Freire is reproducing. He's just reproducing what we're going to see in this episode, in this chapter, is that all, all he's doing in the first half of this chapter is reproducing that essential idea of Marxism in the context of knowledge being the bourgeois property. Okay. 
So he says, orientation in the world so understood places the question of the purposes of action at the level of critical perception of reality. So it's a lot of words to say. Some of us have a critical perception of reality. We're critical theorists. We're Marxists. We have an awakened consciousness of the purpose. He says the purpose of action. Orientation in the world so understood places the question of the purposes of action where at the level of critical perception of reality. So the people who perceive that we are transforming reality, the Marxists, and know the purposes for which we are doing so, the Marxists are to be the ones who get to orient how we do what we do with the world. So Freire is reproducing Karl Marx's ontology of man right here. And that is the starting point for everything else he's advocating in this chapter, which like I said, is the workhorse of this book. He says, if for animals orientation, and by the way, this is something Marx did repeatedly trying to differentiate in his ontology of man, his theory of man to, to differentiate man from animal. And remember he didn't believe in God. God was a fictional creation of man. So there's men and there are animals and there's something that makes them different because they're both agents of activity. And what is actually making them different is that man is a subjective agent that has conscious awareness of his subjective experience, which is why he orients a religion of pathos, because he puts that subjective experience and its emotional uh, resonance and re emotional content as center. So you no longer have God as the logos, which is the the rock of reality, you now have God as pathos, the subjective lived experience. And that's what separates man from animals. And man himself is his own God, but it's to be understood through his experience. And so he says, if for animals, orientation in the world means adaptation to the world. For man, it means humanizing the world by transforming it. Humanizing is Marx's whole project. That's the name of his project. And I'm not going to talk about this in just a superficial way. He says that the fundamental difference between man and animals is that animals adapt to the world around them, which is to say really that they're subject to a sovereign logos, whereas man has something more going on. It's man's duty because of his conscious uh, capacity to be a subject and thus a creator and thus to see himself as a creator through his conscious awareness of his subjective experience, which he can articulate in language, thought language. Because of that, man does not adapt to the world. Man, what differentiates man from the animals is not adapting to the world he lives in. It means humanizing the world by transforming it. In other words, the world becomes the thing that man can envision a particular way in his head. Man is a human. Man's subjective consciousness is humanist, humanistic in, in orientation because he's a man. And so man works upon the world to make the world more like human consciousness as his object. So man is humanizing the world. It's a transformation. I read this somewhere, but I can't find it in Marx specifically. So Marx Mineta wrote it this way. It may have been another analysis of him in his work. Is It's the transformation of jungle to garden is the kind of metaphor. Or even, if you want, jungle to city. But the garden was really supposed to be the dialectical synthesis that you want. The garden, rather than the hyper-ordered city that depends on it's gritty and grimy and there's all these problems and crime and the laws have to be strict or blah, blah, blah. So what you're actually looking for is to create the garden out of the jungle. In other words, you're trying to create a simulacrum of the city, but within a natural environment. That would be very Rousseau, and that's where all of this really kind of comes from. And so for man, the purpose in life is to humanize the world by transforming it. People who participate in this are on the right side of history. People who neglect to participate in this or resist it are not on the right side of history or on the wrong side of history. Okay, so this is the Marxist dichotomy of the world rooted in his ontology of man. This is a deep religious view. This is where the duties of conscience for those of you who pay attention to law and religion come in. The duties of conscience of conscience in Marxist theology are to humanize the world by transforming it. And it's right here, that's what he says. It's man's purpose in being. Orientation in the world for animals means adaptation to the world. For man, it means humanizing the world by transforming it to make the world in his own image. 
And this is a dialectical process. So when you make the world, the world makes you in, a, in return. And then you reflect on that in praxis and make the world in the next step. And so humanizing the world is supposed to also humanize man. And humanized man is a truly social man, or in other words, socialist man who lives in socialist society in a humanized, perfected garden like depicted in Soviet realistic art, which is what that was all about. Okay, so you have to understand that this is this is religion. This is a deep religion and the purpose of mankind, the duties of conscience, are to humanize the world by transforming it. But of course, as you just told us, the only people who can do this correctly are the ones who understand its purpose, right? So he's talking about the orientation of man in the world is humanizing the world by transforming it. But in the previous paragraph, he finished with orientation in the world, so understood, places the question of the purposes of action at the level of critical perception of reality. So only the Marxists properly perceive reality. They do so through a critical perspective on it. Nobody else perceives reality because they're caught up in the ideology that's created by the dominant group to maintain itself. This is the Marxist view of the world. This is why they think they uniquely, as Gnostics, get to dictate how we're going to do things, and it'll all work out. Freire says, for animals, there is no historical sense, no options or values in their orientation in the world. For man, there's both an historical and a value dimension. Men have the sense of project in contrast to the instinctive routines of animals. This is just a repackaging of Marx. This isn't even like Marx pulls this same stunt in the Communist Manifesto. I think it's in Capital also. I'd have to double check that. It's certainly in the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. It's just reproduction. And of course, George Lukács also reproduces this. We're going to actually hear from Lukács before the end of this episode some more directly reading out of history and class consciousness, because I'm almost convinced that Freire just repackaged, actually not directly Marx, although that's obviously some of it, but also Lukács is, uh, frankly, a very trenchant interpretation and understanding of Marx in history and class consciousness. Reading these two books simultaneously has been really interesting because it's really clear, first of all, what Marx was about by reading Lukács, and then it's very, very clear that Freire was repackaging what you see in history and class consciousness uh, in the educational frame. And that's basically all that's going on. We're going to hear some of that near the end. But going on with his ontology of man, Freire says the act, and remember, this is to frame out what literacy means, just to keep context here. So we're going to redefine literacy entirely. It says the action of men without objectives, whether the objectives are right or wrong, mythical or demythologized. So mythical means that it's, in, it's subscribed to the ideology justifying the existing order. Demythologized basically means critical. Naive or critical is not praxis, he says. Though it may be the orientation in the world, and not being praxis, it is action ignorant both of its own process and of its aim. The interrelation of the awareness of aim and process is the basis for planning action, which implies methods, objectives, and value options. In other words, he's saying only the critical view. So he's saying the action of men without objectives is not praxis. You have to have objectives. In fact, you have to have methods, objectives, and value options, and only the Marxists are going to have the correct ones, is what he's going to say. But so far, he hasn't. He says whether you have to have objectives, whether right or wrong, mythical or demythologized, naive or critical, right? And so people of purpose are creating a world. And then what he's going to do is say that the Marxists are the only ones creating the humanized world. Everybody else is creating the oppressive world. And he gets all Freire in here by repackaging all of this into the educational dimension. That's where we're going next with this. Now we've got the ont Marx's ontology of man reproduced, and he's going to pack it into education, and education is going to reproduce the Marxist theory exactly. And the bourgeois property is going to be knowledge or literacy or formal education, you know, having obtained formal education, and maybe even the credentials associated with it. Okay. So he package, he's going to package all this into education and make the case that the manner of teaching itself, as well as the selection of texts, which would be the hidden curriculum between them, betrays the presence of a philosophy of man, which is basically a theology. He's then going to set to exposing the bad one while arguing that a true philosophy of man, which is the Marxist one for him, should be the one chosen because it's smarter and more moral 
and more clear in its purpose than the other. So the conscious humanizing transformation is what we have to adopt. And he says, going on from where we were, teaching adults to read and write must be seen, analyzed, and understood in this way. Which way? What we just said, men uh, with objectives are going to do the praxis on the world, okay? And that requires having uh, methods, objectives, and value options. And he says, teaching adults to read and write must be seen, analyzed, and understood in this way. The critical analyst will discover in the methods and texts used by educators and students practical value options that betray a philosophy of man, well or poorly outlined, coherent or incoherent. There's always a theory of man. The Marxists have a good one, as the troll's truism that he's going to play upon. Only someone with a mechanistic mentality, which Marx would call grossly materialistic, could reduce adult literacy learning to a purely technical action, like, say, learning how to sound words out, like phonics. Such a naive approach would be incapable of perceiving the technique itself as an instrument of men in their orientation in the world is not neutral. Okay? And I think I said is instead of as. Such a naive approach would be incapable of perceiving that technique itself as an instrument of men in their orientation in the world is not neutral. We shall try, however, to prove by analysis the self-evidence of our statement. And so the triple fallacy, and it's really probably like fallacy stacked upon fallacy upon fallacy here, but the triple fallacy of all of Marxism is based, uh, that Marxism is based on then comes up, comes to, to head here. One, Ideology is always present anyway, so we're justified in applying Marxist ideology. Two, in fact, they say there isn't an ideology, it's the anti-ideology. What a funny little trick they play there. Two, Marxist ideology is the only one that gets it right because they say it's anti-ideology by Marx's cookbook's definition of ideology, which is that which justifies dominance and oppression in the world. So they need to apply the Marxist ideology three to the exclusion of all others. Three fallacies. This is all non sequiturs stacked up on top of each other. It's actually difficult to count the fallacies because there are fallacious assumptions in each of those three things and the conclusions don't follow properly from one to the next. Ideology is always present anyway. Uh, no, not necessarily. And so they're justified. No, that doesn't justify using a particular approach at all. Even if there is always one necessary, it doesn't justify using a particular one. So that's already both a fallacy and a non sequitur and does not follow their idea. So therefore, or sorry, and so this is a second set of assumptions. Their ideology is the only one that gets it right. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, it's horrifically bad. So they need to apply it. And so that is not a non sequitur because if it did get it right, you would need to apply it. But it's just a fallacious assumption that it does get it right. And then to the exclusion of all others, that is actually a non sequitur, that theirs needs to be applied, but no others can be considered, no competition, total totalitarian conformity. Nope, that's not implied anywhere. So this is not logical at all, but it's necessarily totalizing, in other words, totalitarian, in that it claims to explain all other ideologies along with everything else in the world. Um... And it's totalitarian in the fact that it's made out to be the only legitimate possible choice that has to be applied and applied universally. And so when I say that it claims to explain all other ideologies, that's one of the things Marxism does, is it explains any competitor as part of the bourgeois system that's trying to keep Marxism out. And so all the other possible approaches to education you could use are just part of the bourgeois conspiracy theory that they posit is holding society together. Remember, Marxism is just a giant conspiracy theory that reality and functioning in reality and a functioning society are set up by a gigantic conspiracy of false justification and illegitimacy to keep certain people in power who don't deserve it and not pay for all of Marx's expenses and buy him beer and tobacco. That's what it really boils down to for these guys is that they don't understand that there is legitimacy but not perfect legitimacy, but there is a lot of legitimacy behind, especially a merit-based uh, hierarchy in a liberal order. And they can pick at the places where that hierarchy is not perfectly legitimate because the meritocracy or whatever is not perfect in its application, whether that's through nepotism or corruption or whatever else. They can pick at those places and then they can say, 
This whole system's completely illegitimate. That's why those people are on top, and that's why I don't get to be. This is why you see Robert Reich on Twitter saying that bootstrapping is a fake ideology and that it's not actually possible to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Is because they believe that the system is actually totally fraudulent. And the reason they believe that is because their system is totally fraudulent. The way you climb in a communist system is by kissing ass. That's how you climb. It's completely fraudulent. It's, in fact, one of the least uh, legitimate hierarchies that you can possibly establish. And so they believe everybody who's in a position of power, this is Robert Reich saying, former under, what was it, Bill Clinton's uh, Secretary of Labor, and also a elf of a man or evil communist gnome or something. And so what's he saying is you can't bootstrap your way up because what that means is he believes that the only people who are in positions of power got there illegitimately. They got installed by some illegitimate process set up by cronies. But the reason they believe that is because that's actually how communism works. And so they're projecting the way their worldview works. And so what they believe is that the people who are in those corrupt positions, appointing people corruptly in the intrinsically corrupt system, create a mythology so that's where Freire said here, whether it's mythologized or demythologized, mythical or demythologized, they create a mythology called what Marx called ideology that justifies why this happens and how it happens and who gets to be the winners and who gets to be the losers, which is all just a big series of lies, really a gigantic social religion for why some people get to be on top and other people don't. But of course, that's exactly what Marxism produces is a bunch of lies for why who, who the, the people in charge get to be on top. And so it's a totally projection. But you can see this is like why they think this way. And you see it here in Freire. Um, but Freire says that this is self-evident, right? It's self-evident that um, their people's or that people's orientation to the world is not neutral. And so the conscious should be able to lead how it goes. And it's only self-evident if you see the world through a twisted Marxist lens like he does. But then he says he's going to prove it anyway because you apparently have to prove self-evident things. But the reality is because it makes no sense unless they throw down a chapter of gobbledygook and they love to hear themselves talk while bragging that they're uniquely right in what is allegedly obvious that nobody else can understand. In other words, he's creating a hyper-reality and setting himself up as the person who describes that hyper-reality where nobody else can. So to make his case, what Freire now does is outlines two sections, and that was the entire opening, the entire uh, ontology of man section. And it's not that hard to follow. Um, I know that I had a lot of kind of side takes or whatever, but it's very straightforward. There's always a theory of education in edu any educational process. That educational process always has a theory of man behind it. And ultimately, what he's going to say is that unless you're applying a theory, you're not doing the real work. You're not going to transform reality in a purposed way. And that's what separates man from animals. And the, he's going to make the case that the Marxist conception of doing the work is, in fact, the only really good one. And to make that case, Freire outlines two sections about the illiterate and how illiteracy is actually framed. And like I said, these are called the illiterate as the empty man and the illiterate as the marginal man. So we're going to compare those over these two sections. So in the first of these two sections, and this is a little bit of hard reading. So far, Freire has not been hard to read uh, in this book, but this chapter, it gets difficult. So in the first of these sections, he explains how people wrongly see illiterates as empty vessels instead of suffering oppressed people who are full of generative ideas about their oppressive conditions, which they simply lack a vocabulary for, both literally and politically. They don't know the words to describe their experience, and they don't know how to make those words be politically actionable where they can be heard and create change in the world. They can't transform and thus humanize, as Marx would have it, reality because they don't have the capacity. And so illiterates in this framing are, as, as Freire puts it, hungry and thirsty to know and understand. And he calls this model of education that comes in that sees the illiterate as the empty person, a nutritionist view of education, which he erects as a straw man of what education is actually about and then knocks down. He says, insofar as the textbook, or it's really, he says the primer, but he's, what he's doing in the chapter is he's describing two hypothetical 
primer textbooks that are organized in different ways, one of which is clearly meant to be a very bad textbook and one of which is meant to be a very good textbook. And he says, insofar as the primer or the textbook is the mediating object between the teachers and students, and the students are to be filled with, the, with words the teachers have chosen, one can easily detect a first important dimension of the image of man that here begins to emerge. It is a profile of a man whose consciousness is spatialized and must be filled or fed in order to know. Okay, so this, before I go on with Freire and his nutritionist thing, you've got to get what's happening here. This is where it's going to happen. This is where the Marxist theory of education becomes Marxism in education. Okay, so this is, this is, this is where it's going to start to happen. This chapter is where it happens. Okay. You have the two textbooks that he's comparing are one in which it's made out of generative words that came out of the peasants themselves and one in which the teacher chose the words. And so what he's erecting is the idea that in a textbook written by educators that people in the existing society who are formally educated and get to decide what it means to be formally educated are going to pick words and phrases and put them into the book. And then when they go and apply them, Students are to be filled with the words the teachers have chosen. That's literally what he says. And so thus, one can easily detect a first important dimension of the image of man that here begins to emerge as the profile of a man whose consciousness is spatialized and must be filled or fed in order to know. That's his nutritionist thing. So what he's saying is education could be this way. And if you are naive and if you don't use his generative words approach, if you're not engaging the politics instead of something else if you're using your own like set of words where the purpose is these words are kind of easy to learn to read and then you can progress from those words to harder words and so on like an actual education of reading um starting with basic skills and working your way up through phonics or whatever else he's like no 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 if the teacher if a reading teacher disconnected from the politics especially is choosing these words then what you see is the teacher believes that the man is an empty vessel to be filled and to be filled with what with the words which words the words the teachers have chosen which reproduce the existing society in other words the bourgeois ideology is going to reproduce itself through the educational program because the bourgeois ideology is what the false consciousness of the teacher is filled with so they're going to pick the words in context with that and so then they're going to fill people up with the knowledge of the existing society and reproduce the existing society from one generation to the next that's what he's saying education is actually about, because uh, unless it's what he recommends, which we'll hear in a second in the next part. And so being formally educated, having knowledge becomes bourgeois property. So, so much of what we talk about in, say, cynical theories follows from this research justice, other ways of knowing linguistic justice even, where it's now at the level of which languages are acceptable, culturally responsive teaching, all of this follows directly from this. If you just impose the existing system on people educating, you're educating them to be white, middle class, male, blah, 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 to work in factories or whatever it is, da, 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 and you're installing in them a view of education that reproduces the existing system so has no possibility of creating a liberation from that. If you teach kids without culturally responsive education, it's not going to be in generative words they say that they resonate with or that inspire them to want to learn. That is interesting for them, like, say, talking about race and poverty is very interesting. It's very stimulating, and it causes lots of arguments and hijacks and distracts from the actual mathematics and statistics lesson. What they say, if you don't do that, then the kids won't engage, and they won't understand what's being taught. And what you're actually going to be doing is also imposing. You're filling them with the idea of the existing society through explicit and hidden curriculum. And that's the thing he's erecting it as a straw man of education in saying that you have to knock down under the model of the illiterate as the uh, empty man. And so it's key to understand that what Freire is saying is that the existing model of education where your kids actually learn to read and do math is actually the existing society taking them as empty vessels or bank accounts, that's his banking model of education, in which to deposit or fill with knowledge that is actually only that thing which the existing society calls knowledge. It's not real knowledge. 
It's not true knowledge. It doesn't even know about oppression. It doesn't know anything about the pathos-driven religion of Marxism and how it sees the world. It's instead actually a reproduction of the existing system that's being deposited into them so that they become little automatons who then reproduce the exist go on to reproduce the existing system. So all this stuff he said in the previous chapters about some people learn to read and they get jobs, but most people don't. Well, it's the ones who actually, what he's suggesting is it's the ones who actually adopted this, the, the script of the existing system that actually ended up being successful, whereas people who didn't resonate with that or it didn't take, they're the ones who don't. And so Freire writes, this nutritionist concept of knowledge, so common in current educational practice, is found very clearly in the primer. Illiterates are considered undernourished, not in the literal sense, and he has to do this guilt stuff in which many of them actually really are, but because they lack the bread of the spirit. And so the bread of the spirit now, in what he's saying, because remember, he's accusing from earlier chapters, he's accusing the existing educational model of being messianic, which is iron law of woke projection. It's saving people from their, their illiteracy by injecting the existing society's framework into them and making them competent to participate in the existing oppressive order. And right, and so education, formal education, literacy, knowledge, that which the existing system considers to be formally educated, knowledge uh, and and literacy is being fed into them as the bread of the spirit, right? They're undernourished, not literally, although most of them really are, he says, but because they lack the bread of the spirit, where the spirit is the geist that characterizes society, just like Hegel was talking about. And so you can either reproduce that or you can eject from that and do something different. He says, consistent with the concept of knowledge as food, illiteracy is conceived of as a poison herb, intoxicating and debilitating persons who cannot read or write. Thus, much is said about the education of illiteracy to cure the disease. In this way, deprived of their character as linguistic signs constitutive, I can't believe I said that wrong, uh, constitutive of man's thought language, words are transformed into mere deposits of vocabulary, the bread of the spirit that the illiterates are to eat and digest. Okay, so rather than becoming political consciousness in thought language, which is consciousness, words are stripped of their their value. They're alienating you from the world that you actually live in because they're mere deposits of vocabulary. And that's mistakenly treated as the bread of the spirit fed to illiterates by the messianic teachers, which of course is, this is the argument that he's making about what education is. This is a straw man of what education is, unless it's Marxist. This nutritionist view, he says, of knowledge perhaps also explains the humanitarian character of certain third world adult literacy campaigns. If millions of men are illiterate, starving for letters, thirsty for words, the word must be brought to them to save them from hunger and thirst. See, so there's your Messiah. And the hunger and thirst, these are definitely gospel allusions. They're all in scare quotes, by the way. The word, according to the naturalistic concept of consciousness implicit in the primer must be deposited. So in other words, the word, according to the naturalistic concept of consciousness implicit in the primer, the hidden curriculum, must be deposited, not born of the creative effort of the learners. So it's being deposited by the existing society, not being brought out of the oppressed in their creative effort, which thus alienates them from their own education process as creators, creative process of learning. It's alienating them from that, which is why you have all this project-based learning nonsense in schools, besides the fact that it trains them to be activists. It's to teach them to be creative learners. No, they, they actually need basic skills. And so he says, as understood in this concept, man is a passive being. The object of the process of learning is to read and write and is not its subject. As an object, his task is to study the so-called reading lessons, which are in fact almost completely alienating and alienated, having so little, if anything, to do with the student's sociocultural reality. So again, the alienation, this is just a reproduction of Marx, okay? So for Marx, work is what connects you as a subject, productive work with a hammer and a sickle, is what connects you 
to as a subject to the object of the world and puts them in relationship so that you know yourself as creator. Here it's learning, becoming educated. And so when you are learning what somebody else wants you to learn, you are alienated from the creative process of your own learning and you are alienated from knowledge itself. So knowledge is bourgeois property and you are alienated from it. And if pedagogy, the existing pedagogy, the theory of education becomes the ideology by which that system is maintained and its purpose is to reproduce oppression completely in the so-called students who are to study, not learn, that which is being deposited into them, alienating them from their own education, their own ability to learn, and through learning come to know themselves and the world, which would be made right if it were done from generative concepts that uh, have lots to do with the student's sociocultural reality. In other words, political lessons rooted in more or less in reality, grievance politics about what ex what their experience is. So this is really deep in the Marxian theology. But what's going on is that Freire's point is to reveal the hidden philosophy of man that's already present in education. And what is it? It's that man cannot understand without instruction. And so uh, the existing society gets reproduced by instructing him, thus alienating from him from his own learning process and from his own education. And so crap like culturally re relevant or whatever responsive education has to be used in order to uh, reconnect man to his learning process, to center the learner. And we're going to kind of talk about that near the end. I wrote a little thing. It's a little abstract, but it gets real Marxist theology. So Freire says, analysis of these texts then reveals a simplistic vision of men, of their world, of the relationship between the two. Remember of the of men in the world and all this words and deposited. Let me back up a second. Remember the point of he said is that education is so that you can learn the word, so that you can speak the world. Right? So you speak the word to proclaim the world is actually what he actually says. The last section in this chapter is sowers of the word. Right? And so the idea is that you're going to make the word politically relevant, politically charged, a magic spell, a Gnostic magic spell, that then is going to create the world that you want. Okay? That's Marxism. And he says, analysis of these texts reveals then a simplistic vision of men, of their world, of the relationship between the two, and of the literacy process that unfolds in that world. So you deposit the existing world into people. That's the word they speak. That's the world they proclaim, but they haven't proclaimed anything new. They've only re they, they haven't proclaimed anything at all. All they've done is reiterate that which already exists. And as we'll get to in chapter seven or eight or whatever it is, that they never denounced the existing world to proclaim the new one, to announce the arrival of the new one. So they're uttering the word, but they're not speaking, as he drew a distinction about previously. They are not able to proclaim the world. All they're able to do is reiterate and reproduce the already poisoned world if they're just being educated by having that world deposited into them, which becomes their vocabulary, the language that they speak, the ideas that they have, the ideology that they've now had groomed into them. So this is, by the way, why right now they've been our schools are being exposed. I did the three part series groomer schools. We've been OK groomering on Twitter for a while. That's now trended. Disney's all involved. We're seeing a lot of this stuff is definitely there's a, the bill in Florida. Uh, that they came out and lied about and called Don't Say Gay. And now everybody realizes that they're grooming and they've been exposed as groomers and the Marxists are flipping out. And so by the time this podcast actually comes out, this will probably have already occurred. But I put this on Twitter already um, just for whatever it's worth. I'm recording this on the 30th of March, 2022. So they have not yet fully done this. This is the beginning. But what they're going to do is they're going to say the education is already grooming because this is what Freire is saying. It's already grooming people into the existing system. It's already grooming people into the Americanism or the, the Western values or liberalism or Christianity or whatever. It's already grooming. Kids are already being groomed by their parents and their teachers in the existing system because they're having the existing system deposited into them. It's grooming them to participate and succeed in the existing world. And therefore, what they're doing is not being groomers. They're participating in what everybody else participates in, but they're doing so in the conscious way. 
And they're doing so in the conscious way that is, in fact, anti-grooming. It will teach the children to recognize through critical analysis that they are being groomed by the existing system, by their parents, by their religion, which they need to thus throw out and use the Freirian Marxist model, which is superior. So they, that's what they will say. I guarantee you that will be the dominant narrative about the entire grooming thing in schools by the time this comes out, probably. And so what he says, analysis of these texts reveals then a simplistic vision of men, of their world, of the relationship between the two, and of the literacy process that unfolds in the world. In other words, people who think that the, the education should be about education have a simplistic understanding of everything, including men, the world, education, literacy, how it all works, everything, which is why you're going to need the Marxists to do it. And so he gives a few example sentences in Portuguese that I'm not going to butcher for you. And he says, these are linguistic contexts that when mechanistically or sorry, mechanically memorized and repeated or derived of their authentic dimension as thought language in a dynamic interplay with reality. Thus impoverished, they are not authentic expressions of the world. But this is what we hear, for example, in critical race theory, is that people have to, they have a structurally determined unique voice of color. And if they don't speak from that structurally determined unique voice of color, they're not authentically representing their unique voice. They're not authentic representatives of their racial group and its political relevance. They are the black face of white supremacy. If you're Larry Elder, they're making trans jokes from a position of white supremacy or white privilege. If they're Dave Chappelle, they are black faces who don't want to be black voices or brown faces who don't want to be brown voices. According to Ayanna Presley, they are racially black, but not politically black. According to Nicole Hannah Jones, who, is that right? Yeah. Nicole Hannah Jones, who authored the 1619 project. It's the same thing again and again and again. Here, if you repeat that which you learn in the formal education process, you are impoverished. You are not giving authentic expressions of your world because you're just mechanically memorizing sentences and syllables. You're not actually learning to identify sounds and connect them to the written word and learn to read new sounds, which is what phonics actually teaches. No, this is what's actually he's claiming is going on. And so you are creating inauthentically educated people through this formal education process. They're formally educated, but they actually don't know anything. And formally educated here means literate, means having knowledge in addition to the kind of corrupted credentialism that they're actually imp- uh, uh, imposing on everybody through, again, another application of the Iron Law of Woke Projection. Their authors of these inauthentic words, he says, Do not recognize in the poor classes the ability to know. Well, that's just a salacious remark that's not true. They do not recognize in the poor classes the ability to know and even create the texts that would express their own thought language at the level of their perception of the world. That's just why you need child-centered education, where the children are generating the lessons, right? That's what what we see happening. Your kids go to Paulo Freire schools. The author's Instead, he says, the authors repeat with the texts what they do with the words. That is, they introduce them to the learner's consciousness as if it were empty space. Once more, the nutritionist concept of knowledge. So rather than taking for granted that the oppressed or the child as a kind of uh, noble savage knows crucial things about the world that could inform everything and would actually keep them engaged and, and, and help them learn better. This is the fundamental assumption of culturally relevant teaching, by the way the other CRT, rather than assuming that, no, the educators believe they may be no best. And again, you see the iron law of oak projection. Clearly, they may be no best, and they're going to set curriculum, and they're going to teach people to actually, you know, learn skills-based education that's going to make them knowledgeable, literate, and formally educated in the existing system. In other words, give them access to the bourgeois property of education and literacy in the existing system that just reproduces the, the whole. And that's the problem. That's the thing he's knocking down. And he says it creates an inauthentic expression. And it stems from what he says is that these people, the, the, the prevailing belief is that they don't know their own world well enough. And so he puts the guilt trip, the moral, uh, the draining of moral authority is, is built in in his analysis, which is a salacious claim. The authors do not recognize in the poor classes the ability to know. The abil- they're incompetent. They're illiterate. They're stupid. Really nasty. He then is going to contrast this. So that's the illiterate as the empty man. And he, that's what the prevailing education system is. And you, know, you see the complete Marxification of education, which is what he's achieved. 
And now we're going to look at the illiterate as the marginal man. And this is going to unlock a lot of stuff for you that you've heard in, <laughs> in all of this woke Marxist not. Uh, nonsense, all this centering this, decentering that, center that, center this, decenter whiteness, center people of color, center voices, blah, blah, blah. All the centering is about to make a lot of sense. Kimberly Crenshaw's paper being called Mapping the Margins is going to make a lot of sense. The fact that her point was that the margins of black nationalism or black liberationism, I should say, and white or just regular feminism are black women. Black women are relegated to the margins of each, and the point is to bring them to the center. And if you look at the the wheel of power that they often draw with lots of different identities and factors in which the Marxist uh, structure of the world can be done, they draw on the center of the very center is power. Power is at the center. What both Freire and Lukács tell us is that from the center is where you can actually see the totality of society, which is going to bring us back into the Marxist theology deeply again. But now this section, this is why I have to split this chapter into two. You see how detailed this is and how crucial it is to understand the Marxification of the idea of education. The illiterate is a marginal man. In this section, what Freire is going to do now is compare off of what we just talked about and frame the illiterate differently as a marginal man, which is marginalized as a process by the structural power of what? Literacy or formal education or having knowledge, being knowledgeable which he was going to he's going to mistake for being recognized illegitimately by the existing system as being knowledgeable. He then goes on to explain all of this like I said is as a process whereby the existence of a formal education system that's not his marginalizes the people who are illiterate according to what you have uh, according to the standards of society. So the illiterate is going to be made marginal by the process of education from which they're structurally excluded. This is a perfect reproduction, by the way, just to go kind of tangential. In 1980, a guy named Michael Oliver in Britain came up with what we called the social model of disability. Before that, there were two models of disability. This is in disability studies history. We talk about this in cynical theories and whatever the sixth chapter, you can go check it out and see it in detail there. The progression. There were two models, which was the medical model that being disabled is a medical phenomenon. And then there's the individual model, which says that most or much or some at least of their responsibility for dealing with their disability lands on the individual. So the medical model would say some of that might land on the doctor or the doctor working with the individual to overcome this. Okay. So for Astute listeners, sorry, the third model is a social model, is that the society itself has some responsibility to meet the disabled person part way. And that has been hijacked by disability Marxists or ability Marxists to go all the way that says that which disables people is not their disability, in fact, but the fact that society isn't fully accommodating of it. So society is disabling the person. And so here we have society is making the illiterate marginal. Okay, but what you're actually seeing, by the way, is the same progression that's happened in social emotional learning. If you recall that podcast, it was originally a personal responsibility model. That would be the individual model of disability. You're disabled, deal with it. Then transitioning to a civic participatory model of social emotional learning. And that's where uh, that's ta that's analogous to the medical model where now there are certain professionals like doctors who are going to work in tandem with you to help you kind of overcome it and resources can be put into the medical individual complex. And then there's the mark, the one that puts it in the fully social realm, which is hijacked by Marxists into transformative social emotional learning. And so this same hijack uh, viral insertion or whatever from personal responsibility to, to collectivist framing is is reproduced in both places. Uh, but Freire is going to do it literacy, right? So the society is structured in a way such that people who are literate or educated or knowledgeable have more advantages is itself a structural Marxist style structural structural phenomenon. And having access to knowledge, having access to literacy, having access to formally being formally educated is a false kind of status. It's bourgeois property that these people give themselves and justify through the ideologies of, of, of pedagogy and, and society. Okay. And so there's this very weird, very 
false, very Marxian assumption all tied up in here that the good life, in other words, being in the garden, if we want to wax uh, theological, is actually man's birthright. It's not something that he has to work hard to pry from indifferent nature. It's your birthright to live in the flawless garden. So again, Marx and Rousseau are not that far apart here. It's a very privileged view of the world that things are just going to be great and work out, right? And it's our birthright to have a comfortable life, not something that we have to work really hard to obtain and then maintain in fragile systems that protect us. Uh, as anybody who's owned a home, which is valuable to do, understands you work really hard to try to preserve this property and then one windstorm comes along and messes everything up. Uh, you have to work hard against nature to preserve. But no, that's not their view. Their Marxian view is entitlement. It's that the man's birthright is to be in the Garden of Eden. The division of labor is what Marx says expelled us. And that's the creation of God was in service to maintaining the division of labor. And thus, we all should have the good life without having to do anything. And that's the vision that they want to try to take us to, which ignores nature, which of course limits your subjectivity because it imposes itself upon you, and therefore it has to be overcome so that the world has been remade in the garden. But all of that's down at the bottom of all of this philosophy. So everybody has a right to be in the highest echelons of society and fully accepted. And if they're not, then society has rendered them illiterate, so unqualified in a false construct or unknowledgeable or uneducated or disabled or in some way marginal or other, whether it's by some other identity category or whatever. And so their birthright is at the center where power lives, where you can see the totality because it's a holistic theory. That's how Marxism works. And they belong there by birthright. And so they're just going to force their way there. That's what Marxism is really about. So what does Freire tell us? He says, and I'm not reading these whole sections. He says, still more and that's that word didn't copy correctly into my notes from the document. It's a PDF. Still more, the structural perception, I think is what it's supposed to say. The structural perception of illiteracy revealed in these texts exposes the other false view of illiterates as marginal man. Those who consider them marginal must nevertheless recognize the existence of a reality to which they are marginal. Not only physical space, but historical, social, cultural, and economic realities. That is, the structural dimension of reality. That's all Marxism cares about. Which is what? It is the dialectical interplay of a oppressive superstructure justifying its own power and existence with the exploited infrastructure that does all the productive, valuable work that it's stealing from in order to continue exist, to exist. The class relations, which are class antagonism, or the social relations, which are characterized by class antagonism. Okay, so that's the structural dimension of reality, is that everything's a stratified system in conflict across the line of stratification, because the upper class is illegitimately exploiting the lower class and creating a mythology called an ideology to justify continuing to do it. In this case, it's being educated or literate or having knowledge. In this way, illiterates have to be recognized as beings outside of, marginal to something, since it's impossible to be marginal to nothing. This is philosophical nonsense, just to justify some crap he's about to say. But being outside of or marginal to necessarily implies a movement of the one said to be marginal from the center where he was to the periphery. No, that's actually not true. He might have started in the margins and stayed there, but just to point that out. But this is where I said that the Marxist belief or here Freirian belief, is that the birthright is at the center, and that he, by not learning to read, for example, he, the illiterate man, before we came along and created an ideology of literacy, was at the center of his own society, of his own community, of his own village, of his own commune, actually, and then the division of labor, or being the division of labor being education versus not educated, uh, came into the picture, or you know, teacher and student in the learning process as a division of labor came in and took the man from the center in his own commune where he centered and moved him to the margins out to the periphery. Okay. So this is a very important false dichotomy 
in all of Marxism that explains this quirk of language that you keep running into, the center versus the margin. This is why they're center this, centering that, centering this. Don't recenter the needs of the privileged. Decenter whiteness, decenter maleness, decenter whatever the, the heck it is, decenter power. It's because they want to occupy the center where the power is. And because that, in their theory, if we want to get a little bit wacky, is the point from which A, you can see everything, but B, you can control everything. And so they're constantly wanting to center this, center that, really center themselves at the uh, middle of center of their narcissistic little universe. And this recalls um, where Marx writes in his uh, critique of Hegel's philosophy of the right from 1844 about religion. And this is, I put that in the Marxist theology, like I told you, it's a very important thing to read. The Marxist theology uh, points out this is that false son versus real son thing. Um, the actual paragraph there from Marx, this is his critique of Hegel's philosophy of the right from 1844 in the introduction. He says, criticism has plucked the imaginary flowers on the chain, not in order that man shall continue to bear that chain without fantasy or consolation, but so that he shall throw off the chain and pluck the living flower. This criticism of religion disillusions man so that he will think, act, and fashion his reality like a man who has discarded his illusions and regained his senses, so that he will move around himself as his own true son. Religion is only the illusory son which revolves around man as long as he does not revolve around himself. Okay. So, center and margin all the way back to Marx. Man is supposed to put himself at his narcissistic self and his probably navel that he can't stop gazing at, at the dead center of the universe, because he is the creator whose subjective view creates the object around him. And this is what centering is all about. And this is, of course, what I said is nonsense. You know, the, you just assume that you're supposed to be at the center and therefore got forced out to the periphery or to the margin. Freire says... This movement was just an action. So it didn't just happen. You didn't just end up on the margin. You got moved there by the structure of reality. That's what he said. This movement, which is an action. Sorry. If you got moved there by the structure, you're got, you got moved there by the people who create, maintain, and benefit from the structure. So those people are your class enemies. And there's your class antagonism. And thus you awaken to that level, which is one of the lower levels of class consciousness that you will use to become a revolutionary proletariat. So this movement, which is an action, that's why they have to say that it has to be an action, that you've been wronged by society. You not being able to read was society wronging you by deciding that being able to read was valuable. This movement, which is an action, presupposes in turn not only an agent, but also his reasons. See? He wants to maintain the good life for himself. So he made literacy matter so that he could center himself and maintain control over all you stupid illiterates. Admitting the existence of men outside of or marginal to structural reality, we may legitimately ask, who is the author of this movement from the center of the structure to its margin? Do so-called marginal men, among them the illiterates, make the decision to move out to the periphery of society? If so, he says, marginality is an option with all that it involves. Hunger, sickness, rickets, pain, mental deficiencies, living death, crime, promiscuity, despair, the impossibility of being. In fact, however, it's difficult to accept that 40% of Brazil's population, almost 90% of Haiti's, 60% of Bolivia's, about 40% of Peru's, and more than 30% of Mexico's and Venezuela's, and about 70% of Guatemala's, would have made the tragic choice of their own marginality as illiterates. If, then, marginality is not a choice, marginal man has been expelled from and kept outside of the social system and is therefore the object of violence. So what he's literally arguing here is that literacy came to these places. There were people who were doing just fine in their communes. Literacy came, started a structured society, making cities like Rousseau, and ejected those people to the margins because they didn't have the necessary skill to participate in the new society that came in or that established itself from within, depending on the circumstances. And thus, they were marginalized. They were forced out of the center of society by society adopting a new technology, which is literacy. 
And this was an illegitimate thing. And the what he's going to what he's making the case is, is that the literacy itself, that which is considered literacy, I should say, the social construction of literacy, is a fiction that did this. And the people who benefit from maintaining that fiction were the agents of that action, the author of that movement from center to structure. So this is reproducing in the context of literacy or education or knowledge, the Marxist structure, the Marxist theory. Okay. And it's an object you are, you have had, if you are illiterate, you're illiterate because the system made literacy matter and thus made you illiterate. And thus you are the object of violence of that system. And the teaching you to read though is also an act of exploitation and violence because it's depositing into you that exact same exploitative mechanism by bringing you into the existing society, which was the thing that oppressed you in the first place. So now you become complicit in the exclusion from the good life of everybody you left behind when you become educated. And you see exactly that logic very being very easy to prey upon in kind of cloistered communities. We see it in the urban ghettos. We also see it in uh, white Appalachia. And this is what centering something is supposed to do. In the Freirian view, you are by birthright centered, but structural forces created by the ideologists, the bourgeoisie of society, of whatever dynamic, came along and pushed you out to the margins against your will. And so you are at the margins. Kimberly Crenshaw would say we have to map those margins and figure out how to create solidarity so that they might uh, create a meaningful politic of identity and an anchor of subjectivity so that they might reclaim the center or be moved to the center. In other words, an inversion of society. Rather than learning to participate successfully in the existing society and build it up by its bootstraps, instead you're taught to invert, turn inside out the existing society by making that which is at the margins at the center. You can imagine like a donut or something like being ripped and flipped around inside out. And that's literally the process that they're describing. You poke a hole in a disc at the middle and you rip it and flip it inside out so that the outer edge becomes the inner ring of a donut. And then what used to be at the the center is now out at the periphery. And this is what centering is supposed to accomplish. This is why we must decenter whiteness. This is why we must center diverse voices, which is all just claptrap. It's all just nice sounding language to say we must invert society in a Marxist way because of this perverted, poisonous, Marxist view of how the world really works, which is ultimately a uh, nasty Gnosticism that believes that the poor, suffering, vulnerable narcissist that's doing this has been flung into a world that wasn't catering to him sufficiently and his freaking entitlement. That's what's really at the heart of all of this. And again, this is what Freire was saying education has to be remade to do, and thus your kids are being taught to be this vulnerable narcissist who's going to invert society while blaming everybody else and saying they're the ones who are actually at the advantage. Freire continues, in fact, however, the social structure, the structure, I'm sorry, the social structure as a whole does not expel nor is marginal man a being outside of. He is on the contrary, and this is where it starts getting Marxist in the terms of that totality thing, the holistic thing. He is on the contrary a being inside of within the social structure, and in a dependent relationship to those whom we call falsely autonomous beings, inauthentic beings for themselves, in other words, the educated. Falsely autonomous, the privileged. They believe they have autonomy because they're in this position of privilege, but it's false autonomy because they're actually just reproducing the existing system. Only the conscious are the truly agentic people in society. Everybody else has false consciousness. Everybody else has false agency. They are falsely autonomous beings, all in service to the existing mythology and, and, and uh, social structure. Man becomes plaything of the social structure, of the discourses if we get postmodern that shape it, or of that which is considered knowledge within it, if we're in the Freirian or postmodern frame. Okay, but now he's saying we're not going to think man isn't actually marginal. So we look at the marginal thing and now we've gone part way. We've initiated a first stage of class consciousness. You are marginal. 
If you're illiterate you've, or uneducated, you've been made marginal by a system that you didn't choose that deposed you from your birthright at the center in the Garden of Eden. You were God expelled you unjustly. He was actually a tyrant that wanted to control you and he threw you out when you figured it out. You've been expelled from your birthright and he's created an entire mythological religion for why you had to be expelled and he gets to stay in, why he's in heaven and you're on earth suffering in a world that you were flung into and didn't ask to join in the first place. It is very religious. And so you have been flung into this situation. You've been thrown into it against your will. You have been marginalized, but then there are people who are marginalizing you. So step one of class consciousness, you are a class, the oppressed, and you're suffering. Step two, you were pushed there by people who falsely claim superiority over you. And they pushed you there by ordering society to their own benefit to exclude you. So you're an antagon you are a class, an antagonistic relation with that other class. That's the second level of critical consciousness or class consciousness if we're reading Lukács. Now we get to the third level of class consciousness. It has different levels. They even say that you need to have different levels or different stages of consciousness. Uh, Lukács is clear about this. George Lukács in History and Class Consciousness. Freire is clear about this. So the third stage now. So first is you are a class that is oppressed. Second is that you are you have been oppressed, you've been put into the situation against your will. The third is actually, this is a dialectical system. You are in relationship. The antagonism that you feel is not oppressor versus oppressed, but it is oppressor interacting with the oppressed to create this dynamic and maintain it. That's a higher level of class consciousness or critical consciousness. And then the next level after that is you are unique in your role to be able to overturn this. In fact, it was your birthright to be at the center. And then the last level of class consciousness is actually knowing how to take over through whatever he said a little bit ago. Um, what was it? The, uh, uh, the operations and tactics and strategies or whatever he said. Um, I don't find it very quickly. There's too many words on my page. But where he said, oh, yeah, methods, and uh, methods, objectives, and value options for installing the new world. So what Lukács tells us is that the class consciousness proceeds in stages. And the actual class consciousness, it's not just a matter of knowing that you're a class that's oppressed. It's not just a matter of knowing that you're being oppressed by this other class or that you... Uh, or in class antagonism with it, it is knowing your role in changing that situation and in fact knowing at the highest level what the end point is supposed to look like. Understanding the whole totality, which can only be seen from the center, which you're being illegitimately excluded from, so you can't see it, so you can't overthrow society. And it's being done by people who are exploiting you and want to keep you out of it for their own benefit. That's Marxism. That's how Marxism sees the world. That's why it's so friggin' resentful. That's why its whole thing is resentiment, because it believes it belongs, entitled, belongs at the center, and that it's being unjustly excluded by people who just want to keep them out, because from the center, you can control everything. When you read How Jews Became White Folks, a charming book in critical race theory, they, they explain how Jews position themselves as white and then move themselves to the center of whiteness so they could be the setters of what whiteness means, which is exactly the same thing that Hitler accused the Jews of, although the underlying philosophy is slightly different, but only slightly. Um, so this is what, what we see in Freire as well. You are actually within the social system. You're an integral part of it. You are creating it. And if you take conscious direction of it, you can seize the means of production and you can start to shape society. And if you know the end point, then you have the consciousness necessary to do it. That's the point of many stages of class or critical consciousness. And that's what Freire is preaching to. And so um, what this boils down to is anything that's not going your way isn't just someone else's fault, but is the fault of everybody that occupies what you see as a dominant class. And if you don't understand this context, then you can't understand your life and its conditions. That's what he's, what, he, what he's trying to teach. And that's what culturally relevant education is about. That's what SEL is, is kind of also facilitating. Teaching this for free is what education is actually about. 
doing it through all the modes of other curriculum, replacing phonics and literacy or mathematics or whatever with the conscious generative concepts is a key part of the Freyerian pedagogy model of critical pedagogy. Every subject becomes about raising critical consciousness and the multiple stages of critical consciousness, including the point where you get to be the Gnostic who understands the secrets of the entire point of the universe, which is to liberate man from anything that might restrain his subjective view, which includes reality, by the way, including the entire existing society and its operation and the things that people say, no, we actually have to have this for it to function because of reality. Okay, so this still doesn't go far enough for Freire, though. The margin of society being part of the whole society must be understood in the way that Marx and Hegel understood it. And that part, and that is, I should say, that the parts can only be understood in terms of the whole. And Lukács is very clear about this, like I keep saying in history and class consciousness. And in fact, what Lukács says, just to kind of quote briefly, he says, the whole system of Marxism stands and falls with the principle that revolution is the product of a point of view in which the category of totality is dominant. So the people who believe that they understand the totality of society, not just in its current operation, but also its future operation, so they're activists because they know where it's supposed to go on the right side of history, that the revolution is the product of a point of view in which the category of totality is dominant. That, Lukács says, is the point upon which all of Marxism either stands or falls. So if that's correct, Marxism is correct. If that falls, then Marxism falls as well. And Lukács argues at length in History and Class Consciousness, which he published in 1923 and wrote over the preceding roughly three and a half years after the Hungarian Soviet regime fell apart, which he was deputy commissar of education for, and installed comprehensive sex education within uh, in order to sexualize the children because it is great for facilitating a Marxist revolution, as we've discussed in other episodes, especially uh, Groomer Schools 1 and 3, uh, those two podcasts talk about the relevance of Lukács' ideas there. And so he argues at length here in History and Class Consciousness, echoing Marx, and then drawing directly off the third chapter of History and Class Consciousness here, that the proletariat must be made conscious as a whole, not just in terms of their class consciousness, but also in terms of the unique role that the class must play in society, which is ultimately, and this is deep Marxism, this is what a lot of people don't understand about Marx. Remember that Marx says that, the, that at the end that the state will wither away because it'll go to a stateless class of society because everything will be spontaneous. So what Marx's argument actually is, is that the class actually, the awakened class, the conscious class is chasing after self-annihilation. It is annihilating itself because its liberation arrives by destroying the system that makes there be classes in the first place. So if the proletariat succeeds, they destroy the class system entirely and there is no proletariat because there's no class system. Now everybody's equal and we have a communist society. We have a commune, a global commune. And because there's no class system, there's no class, there's no need to manage, manage or administer the class or to tend to the class or to try to work out the contradictions across the class because those have all been resolved because the class system itself has been annihilated. The entire society has been turned into the center. There is no margin. There is no edge. Everything is, becomes the center. How magical. So this is what Freire makes the point of education. He's echoing Lukács very clearly. That's what we've just heard from him. So even the illiterate as a marginal man and just accepting that he's marginal is wrong is what Freire's just said to us. Unless we understand that marginalization is itself an active systemic phenomenon created by class division and antagonism, which is produced by those and maintained by those in the superstructure who benefit from it and generate the relevant ideology of society that maintains their position. And this is exactly what he argues explicitly in terms of the superstructure earlier in the book, and he does this again in the next section, which we'll turn to in the next podcast. Uh, and that is that the infrastructure can't actually shape society at all because it's excluded from the center and that's where all the power is. So the superstructure falsely places itself in the center of society. Everything revolves around it, false sun, until man learns to revolve around himself as his own true sun. And then uh, they give themselves, therefore, illegitimately the power to shape all of society and thus push to the margins people who have different views that might threaten their power. That's the Marx 
class consciousness and class conflict theory in a nutshell. And again, Freire's reproducing this. For Marx, capital was bourgeois property. For Freire, literacy, knowledge, being educated. And he, they, they always use the phrase formally educated because they're trying to make it out that the system itself is a fraud. And so being formally educated in it. And of course, if you look at what they're doing, it's iron law vogue projection. That's what they're producing. They're producing a false education model where people who tow the party line get the credentials and the credentials don't reflect education at all. You graduate high school, you can't read 30%, 30% of students. And so just look at it. This is a nightmare. We all, all of our kids go to Paulo Freire schools. Going back to Freire, though, he says a less rigorous approach, one more simplistic, less critical, more technical, would say that it was unnecessary to reflect on what it would consider unimportant questions, such as illiteracy and teaching adults to read and write. Such an approach might even add that the discussion of the concept of marginality is an unnecessary academic exercise. In fact, however, it is not so. In accepting the illiterate as a person who exists on the fringe of society, we are led to envision him as a sort of sick man, for whom literacy would be the medicine to cure him, enabling him to return to the healthy structure from which he has become separated. Very Genesis. That sounds very much like the book of Genesis, right? He is a man who is sick with sin, for whom faith would be the med- or grace would be the medicine to cure him, enabling him to return to the paradise of of the garden from which he has been expelled. It's very religion. Educators, Freire tells us, would be benevolent counselors scouring the outskirts of the city for the stubborn illiterates, runaways from the good life, to restore them to the forsaken bosom of happiness by giving them the gift of the word. So this is directly an inversion of the gospel and the directions to go proclaim the gospel to the world. In light of such a concept, Freire says, unfortunately all too widespread, literacy programs can never be efforts toward freedom. Literacy programs can never be efforts toward freedom. They will, and here's why. And the punchline, simple. Spoiler alert, it's because they reproduce the existing society. Literacy programs can never, your kids learning to read, can never be efforts toward freedom. Why? They will never question the very reality that deprives men of the right to speak up, not only illiterates, but all those who are treated as objects in a dependent relationship. These men, illiterate or not, are in fact not marginal. What we said before bears repeating. They are not beings outside of, they are beings for another. That is, what he's saying is, the existence of a formal education system, or of a concept of literacy, or of a society that makes use of literacy as it is to actually be able to read and understand words and communicate with words in written form, are actually slaves. They're slaves to the system that believes that, and the people that place themselves illegitimately at the center of that system are the ones enslaving them. They have become the productive objects, beings for another of the dominant classes by learning to read, by learning to do math, by becoming educated, because education itself is just part of the existing superstructure that justifies the oppressive existing society. Therefore, Freire tells us the solution to the problem is to become not beings inside of, but men freeing themselves. In other words, to destroy the entire system. You're not inside or outside of the system. There's no center or margin. The entire place becomes the center because you destroy the system itself. This is exactly what I'm telling you. Therefore, the solution to their problem isn't to get educated and start to succeed in the system. It is not to be beings inside of, but men freeing themselves. For in reality, they are not marginal to the structure, but oppressed men within it. Remember, the structure is a dialectical concept. It is the sum total of the relations between the superstructure and the infrastructure that that, that conditions the the range of subjectivities of everybody in society. So they they are the oppressed category within a broader structure. The infrastructure and superstructure, the proletariat and bourgeoisie are not just antag- they're not just in conflict with one another. They're in an antagonistic relationship where each is producing the other in various ways, but the superstructure holds all the cards through illegitimate methods that they've produced for themselves and can't even see. 
Alienated, he says, alienated men, they cannot overcome their dependency by incorporation into the very structure responsible for their dependency. So they can't actually become literate or educated or have knowledge in the existing system because the existing system itself needs to be destroyed, according to Marxism. Complete destruction, complete annihilation. Alienated men, they cannot overcome their dependency by incorporation into the very structure responsible for their dependency. There is no other road to humanization, theirs as well as everyone else's, other than authentic transformation of the dehumanizing structure. Now we turn back to Lukács. Class consciousness, he tells us, is identical with neither the psychological consciousness of individual members of the proletariat nor with the mass psychological consciousness of the proletariat as a whole, but is, on the contrary, the sense become conscious of the historical role of the class. And what is that historical role? He says the proletariat has been entrusted by history with the task of transforming society consciously. And that's going to be achieved through the, like I said a little bit ago, through annihilation, through the total annihilation of the system that produces the structure that produces the class society in the first place. And so here, the illiterate, the solution is not to become literate, but rather to destroy that there needs to be literacy in the first place. And you do that by destroying the society that values literacy and rethinking and reimagining one up from the ground up where everybody started off as equals. And this is what Freire wants to retool education to achieve. And this is what culturally relevant teaching is. Kind of quoting, or not kind of, just straight up quoting from Freire again, turning back to Freire. From this last point of view, the illiterate is no longer a person living on the fringe of society, a marginal man, but rather a representative of the dominated strata of society. So society has to be understood in the totality. That's what Lukács said. That's what Marxism is about. That's the whole essence of Marxism. And so you don't understand him as somebody on the margins of society, but he's actually somebody that's oppressed by the entire relations of the existing society. When you view it from its totality, which they believe they uniquely can do, because everybody else is falsely placed in the center, but if you awaken the consciousness, if you become your own true son that revolves around yourself, you place yourself in the center where all the power is. And you understand that you, as an oppressed person, are part of the society. The relations that condition society are the relations that are oppressing you. So rather, you are a representative of the dominated strata of society in conscious or unconscious opposition to those who, in the same structure, treat him as a thing. In other words, a dehumanization, a complete dehumanization, which is why we're going to humanize the world and humanize man and humanize society. Because allegedly, the people dominating you, say by teaching you to do math or read, are dehumanizing you by depositing the knowledge valued by the existing system into you as though your own knowledge of the world in your state of oppression isn't more important and valuable. They're overriding you with the existing society, telling you you should want to succeed in the existing society. You could get a good job rather than letting you be a generative force to change society where, what did Lukács say? The proletariat has been entrusted by history with the task of transforming society consciously and that class consciousness is identical with neither the psychological consciousness of individual members of the proletariat nor with the mass psychological consciousness mass formation psychosis of the proletariat as a whole, but it is on the contrary, the sense become conscious of the historical role of the class to transform the society consciously, the Gnostic goal, the Gnostic role. And so Freire wants this to be education. So what does he say? He says, um, thus also teaching men to read and write is no longer an inconsequent, an inconsequential matter of ba, be, bi, bo, bu, phonics, of memorizing an alienated word, but a difficult apprenticeship in naming the world. So you're raising consciousness so that they can name the world as it is for them, which they denounce. As Horkheimer said, the, the critical theory was developed because you can't describe the good world from within the existing world, but you can criticize those parts of it that you don't like. So you denounce the existing world and you name and by naming it, by making oppression visible, and then you announce the new world. And that's going to be his main thesis in the next chapter. 
In the first hypothesis, Freire tells us, interpreting illiterates as men marginal to society, the literacy process reinforces the mythicization of reality by keeping it opaque and by dulling the empty consciousness of the learner with innumerable alienating words and phrases. In other words, teaching kids to do math or long division or read or teaching illiterates or whatever kids are illiterates, you're teaching them, then what you're actually doing is that you're dulling the empty consciousness by alienating them from their learning process, which they could become more actively involved in and generative of so that they could, uh, what was it, the difficult task thing that he says? Um, the uh, difficult task of becoming an apprentice to remaking society, right? Um, a difficult apprenticeship in naming the world. That's how I actually phrased it. Sorry, I was looking for it on the page. Um, by contrast, he says, in the second hypothesis, viewing illiterates as men oppressed within the system, the literacy process as cultural action for freedom, which is what we're going to turn to in the next episode, is an act of knowing in which the learner assumes the role of knowing subject in dialogue with the educator. So we're going to go to the idea that the learner is a knowing subject. In other words, that they are bringing something significant to the table in the educational process, and they are in dialogue almost as equals, if not as equals, with the educator. We're going to go away from student and teacher and move into learner and educator who are uh, in a relationship that's like a difficult apprenticeship in learning to name the world through critical consciousness. So you don't have to really teach people to read because inconsequential matters like syllables and memorizing alienated words and tasks and techniques doesn't achieve that. That's for in education. It's why your kids can't read or do math at grade level or at all. For this very reason, it is a courageous endeavor to demythologize reality, a process through which men who had previously been submerged in reality begin to emerge in order to reinsert themselves into it with critical awareness. There's your virus model. Therefore, the educator must strive for an ever greater clarity of what, at times without his conscious knowledge, illumines, I'm assuming it should be illuminates, the path of his actions. Only in this way will he truly be able to assume the role of one of the subjects of this action and remain consistent in the process. See, if the teacher were teaching, he would be dominating and be making the student his object. And you can't have that subject object that's objectifying. He's no, the student's no longer a subject. So an educator is a subject working along an apprenticeship relationship with the learner. And they're actually both learners. And they're actually both educators. And that's a big theme that's like a chapter in the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, that there are, we shouldn't have teachers and students. We should have two student teachers and teacher students. But by here, we're now shifting to the language. He does use the word student a lot and teacher a lot. But we're shifting to the language of, uh, of learner and educator. And so I really um, I, I was reading this and trying to make sense of it at one point. Uh, let me see if I can find the correct one. I, I was on a plane, so I wrote myself a little email about this, um, students versus learners. And I'm just going to, I could publish this, I may publish this as an essay, but this gets deep into the Marxist theology, and this is going to be a little clunky because I never edited it but it's the first draft. But this is what the Paulo Freire in a nutshell is that we've learned so far in this chapter and so on. And we're going to get into the dialogical model and the sower of the word stuff later, but so far, with the orientation of recreating the Marxist theology in the context of education, where the bourgeois property becomes knowledge, or being literate, or educated, um, and thus the point is to what the point of communism in Communist Manifesto Chapter Two is abolish bourgeois property, and so bourgeois property is being educated, abolish being educated, it's literacy, abolish literacy, it's um, you know having knowledge, abolish knowledge, because we have other ways of knowing. We have to make room for other ways of knowing. We have to decolonize the curriculum, folks. That's what that's about. That's what this is. Decolonize the curriculum is this. Put into a terms of colonization, borrowing off of somebody like Franz Fanon or whatever to justify what they're asking for. But that's what it is. It's that decolonize the curriculum is that the existing curriculum reproduces the existing society and its ideology, and is therefore bourgeois property that people who succeed in it get themselves access to, or are granted access to. Really, you can't bootstrap yourself, remember. 
And so you have to abolish that idea entirely. So you have to decolonize the curriculum and replace it with a different curriculum that centers different ideas and different voices and different faces. That's what's going on. Okay, so I wrote this. I'm just going to kind of read it. This is wax is very theological. I was in a mood. But I said, as a rule of thumb, nobody chooses, and this is kind of a good lesson. As a rule of thumb, nobody chooses their words more carefully than Marxist theorists. And this, this here I'm going to dip right into something that annoys the crap out of me. Far from being gobbledygook or word salad, seriously, stop calling it gobbledygook, stop calling it word salad. It's not. These people know what they're saying and they know what they mean by what they're saying. Far from being gobbledygook or word salad, their phrasing is the result of obsessing over the smallest possible connotative shades. This is because they see words as powerful and creative literally generative magic spells that structure the world and thus condition those who inhabit it. That's what the discourses of both uh, Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida are all about. That's what the thought language of Freire is telling you. They see words as powerful and creative, literally generative magic spells that structure the world and thus create the conditions of those who inhabit it. And actually, I said, and thus condition those who inhabit it. That's the socialization. That's why they see education as it is in the existing society by parents, by church, by schools, uh, unless they seize all control of it as grooming. You're being conditioned, groomed, socialized by the existing order. They therefore choose their words, which often seem strange, with extraordinary attentiveness, lest their language through its subtle creative magic on the imagination of both its producer and recipient reproduce structures of dominance. In short, every word to a Marxist theorist is a political dog whistle that hides meaning and enacts power. No word simply means what it means. Every word they deliberately choose is chosen with wizard's care. We also see this apparently peculiar tendency in the verification of other terms, marginalized instead of marginal, minoritized instead of minority, racialized instead of racial. The active process of making marginal, making minority, or making racial, or we could add with Freire, making illiterate, or making disabled, where it otherwise wouldn't be, must be highlighted or centered as they might have it. Something cannot merely be in the minority. Something else, an act of dominance, must be defining people as minority by comparison, minoritizing them. This is, of course, an act of dominance that creates and maintains oppression, so it places subjectivity in the dominator and objectifies the oppressed, alienating them in exactly the way Marx obsessed over. Of course, we just heard from Freire that it's a false form of subjectivity. It's a false form of agency. It's a false form. And we uh, could also say that if we look at, for example, Kimberly Crenshaw, this is why you see her saying that I am black becomes an anchor for subjectivity. That's exactly why. This is why you see her say things like critical race theory is a verb because it's an action verb back against the action that's marginalizing for them. We also see this tendency in the choice of the word learner in place of student. The learner is not the same as the student, and the Marxists understand this and insist upon the former. A learner is a subject in his own learning. A student is the object of a teacher and his vocation. That reproduces dominance. Never mind, of course, that a student is also the, a subject in the process of study, for the Marxist, to whom social relations, which is to say power dynamics between unequals, are paramount, a student only exists in relationship to a teacher unless he is a natural student engaged in a self-directed study, because then that would be a process of learning. A learner, by contrast to the objectified student, is someone who learns. It's utterly unambiguous. No teacher's object. A learner is the active subject of his process of learning. So when we get to Freire's dialogical model, the teacher and student, the educator and learner are in dialogical, dialogue-based relationship as active co-learners, active co-subjects in the process of learning about the society. The learner is, to use the key Marxian word again, centered in his process of learning, 
where the student is made marginal to it by the dynamic of teaching. To paraphrase, as Marx had it in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of the right, the student orbits around the false son of the teacher, while the learner makes himself into the true son at the center of his own learning universe, as God in himself is the learner. Not so for the student, who is but a teacher's pupil. This ostensible peculiarity in linguistic form, then, is not peculiar at all. It is the precise sort of obsession characteristic of a religious fanaticism. It is product, sorry, its product is not gobbledygook either. It's hocus pocus, by which the mundane is transformed through subtlety into the sublime. The word by which the bread of the world becomes a sacramental host. It isn't word salad, it's the word that transforms the self into the bread of life. It's a kind of alchemy that when consistently got, quote, right in accordance with praxis, which is learning through being in the world, opens up the gates to the kingdom from which man finds himself temporarily expelled. Those who are learning, the conscious, can perform the the sacramental rite. For the contemporary Marxist, through speaking the world, one pro sorry, for the contemporary Marxist, through speaking the word, one proclaims the world. So Freire tells us, man replaces God as the true son at the center of his own universe, and so, through his speech, creates the world he inhabits and creates himself. Man is in the process of becoming as well, becoming conscious of himself as his own creator. Creation comes from speech. Then, to speak through, to speak though, man must learn how. To learn to speak, he must become a learner, a man in conscious dialogue with himself in the world. This is praxis, which is reflexive. A man who is a learner then cannot be a teacher's student. That would imprison him in the teacher's creation, not his own. That relationship also must be one of dialogue, learner with learner equal to equal, one creator with another. Mere instruction cannot create, it can only reproduce that which already is, and thus that which, as Goethe explains, has already perished. The sigh of the oppressed people, Mark said, is the religion that believes God spoke the world into being, saw that it was good, and then rested on the seventh day, the day after completion, That world, to Marx, is a dead world. The completion of the world, which is always in the process of becoming, is a lie. The world dies in the instant it sees itself as complete. God, in declaring it done, merely asserts his dominance over a particular stage of being, over a dead world held under his dominion. God, then, is the tyrant and a jailer of man in the dead world he wants to maintain and rule. Man can be set free when he realizes that this is a dead God. The creation of dead men who wanted to maintain the world as it was at an earlier historical time when it was under their control. In what Marx would refer to as reality, the world can never be completed because it is always becoming, transforming from what was through what is to what its creators continually create it to be. The revolution is perpetual. A revolution that stops has died, and the world it left off with is likewise dead. There is no living God but man, through whom the world continually becomes. God is dead. Becoming is the nature of being, and becoming is dialectical. We are all learners, active subjects in the process of learning and transforming ourselves and the world. Teachers are dead gods, false sons who denounce nothing, announce nothing new, and merely proclaim a dead alienating world to students that they force to live in it, outside of the world as it really is. Learners, by contrast, are creators. They are change agents. They are the demiurges of the becoming world. The voice of the Marxist thus repeats the whisper of the serpent, even in this seemingly small thing. Student versus learner. Your teacher is lying to you. You are not his lesser, you are already his equal, and he doesn't want you to know it. You are as he is, learners all. You only need the knowledge that he hides from you and his desire to preserve the world as it is, under his rule. 
maintained selfishly to pretend to satisfy his insatiable libido dominandi. You were but his servant, and you could be free. Learner, free yourself and your own libido. Thence you can free the world and claim it as yours, not his, your garden forevermore. Your humble Prometheus was never a teacher of man, but yet just another learner alongside you. And so that wax is pretty theological, I suppose, and it's pretty fluffy, but that's kind of the way that I saw this theology um, evolving out of this particular chapter, which I was reading and rereading on this plane, trying to fully integrate and understand what's going on with it. In the next episode, and now this is over two hours and a quarter long, you can understand why I split this in chapter into two episodes, and it is crucially important that we go through the rest of chapter six as well to understand Freire. We're going to move forward and see what this active process of learning uh, looks like and what it means to become a sower of the word uh, for Freire. But in this case, um, we've had an active reorientation of what it means to be a learner. We've actually had the Marxification of education. Knowledge itself becomes bourgeois property, whether that's literacy, formal educated, whatever you want to call it, becomes bourgeois property that must be abolished in line with the Communist Manifesto in order to liberate people from the reproduction of the oppressive world that's being reproduced by the transmission of and creation of and maintenance of knowledge that serves only those who consider themselves educated and literate to exclude and marginalize everyone else. We aren't filling the illiterate with skills that they can use to succeed in society, including the illiterate child that you gave birth to and are trying to raise who hasn't learned to read yet. We're not filling them with knowledge that's useful so that they can go out into the world. That would be a terrible way to approach education because it sees them as empty, non-generative, not creators in their own right, thus alienating them. And it also reproduces the existing world, alienating them from the possibilities of their future, certain historical possibilities that have become regarded as utopian possibilities, maybe, as Herbert Marcuse might have put it. And we are alienating them from the learning process itself. And uh, instead, we should see them as marginalized, marginalized by a system that expects them to be educated on terms that preceded them, on terms that benefit the bourgeoisie, whoever has access to the bourgeois capital, in this case, the educated and illiterate, and exclude them unjustly from their birthright. And so they must be resentful of the entire educational process and transform not into or transform from students into learners who are learning, as we'll hear, in dialogue with other learners who happen to be also educators who are further down the road in a complicated apprenticeship of proclaiming the word to transform the world into communism. And that's why your kids can't read. Because Education has been completely Marxified. Not Marxist theory has been put into education. Not that they're being indoctrinated with Marxism. That the very idea of what education is has become a Marxist theory through Paulo Freire. Okay, so it has gone inside education itself. When I say all of your kids go to Paulo Freire schools, what I mean is... They are not being indoctrinated into Marxism. They're nobody standing over them like a Soviet and Sovietizing them. They are being programmed to think about everything, including knowledge, literacy, skills, the whole point of education and participation in society, everything in a Marxist way. It is much deeper, much more insidious, and much more dangerous. And we have to stop this. We absolutely have to stop this. We have to take all of this freery out of education. And that's going to be our very difficult task.